I am pleased to introduce the following half-hour documentary film, Treasures, sponsored by the Ministry of Community and Cultural Affairs. This film is one of a series of documentaries in which we will take a look at the past as seen through the eyes of some of Bermuda's senior citizens. We think that you will find their stories both entertaining and revealing as they relive Bermuda's past and compare it with the present. On the Harbour Road in Warwick is the home of Sir John Sharp, now happily retired following a busy and successful career in both business and politics. This is start is at the beginning and I was born just about one mile from here in that direction. And I was reminded of that about 15 years ago when Quint Ladness and I were canvassing in um, Kyber Pass. Quentin waltzed into this house first and then beckoned me in and um, said, Mrs. Hawker, do you know Mr. Sharp? And Maud looked at me and said, no, Jack Sharp. She said, boy, don't you remember? I said, what's that, Maud? She says, I was in that room the day you were born. I said, well, Maud, my recollection of that day was a little on the hazy side. But it was the truth, because Maud had been a midwife, and at that time, most people were born at home. And I grew up and lived on what was in the nature of a farm. It developed into a livery stable, because my father was in the business, both of trucking and um, providing transportation for people as well through horse and carriage. But we had cows and chickens and pigs and planting arable land. And uh, so our family just grew up on about, I suppose it was about five acres of land with all of these uh, things that you see very little of these days. Father, being in the livery business, uh, we had, all, in addition to horses, we had goats and things. And having a harness maker at his disposal, he always invariably made a small harness for one of the goats. And we had a little goat cart in which we could ride, to which we could hitch this goat and. My brother and I used to ride around a bit in that. We also had ponies that we rode and drove. And um, of course there were about, when we were growing up, I suppose there were about 30 horses and 20 men working there. So there were able, always stables to muck out and horses to clean addition to your normal schoolboy chores of doing homework and that sort of stuff. Well, Warwick Academy was the first school I attended in Bermuda, and it was the last school I attended in Bermuda, because in those days, it took you from age five or six up to age 16 or 17. And, um, I suppose I lived about two miles from War Academy. And we usually either walked initially or got on the back of a trolley that was going in that direction, had a ride, or on the crossbar of a bigger boy's bike until we reached the age when we too could ride a bike. I do remember my first and three-speed bike at that. So uh, that's how we got to our academy. And um, I don't remember anything particular about those years, except that they seemed to be happy years. We always had lots of homework. Mother always uh, 
so that we did our homework. So prob partly as a consequence of that, I suppose I was a reasonably good student that Dwarf Academy anticipated would probably go on to university in the United Kingdom. But um, in those days, I think most of us, parents and children alike, didn't really appreciate the merit or benefits of university like you do today. And um, didn't have the money for it in any case. So instead, I went for one school year to Mount Allison Commercial College in uh, Nova Scotia. In those days there were no flights up, so we went by boat and we returned almost a year later by boat. And um, I suspect I'd only spent one or two nights until then away from home with a friend in Bermuda. So over this same period, while I hope I made the best of it, I was I was homework. I was very homesick to the extent that I recall after Mother died finding um, a diary that I'd kept up there. And in it I crossed off the day every day and occasionally said only 200 days left, only 99 days left, only 98 days left. Only 10 days left. I'll soon be, oh, it was while I was away that, in fact, I got my job at Purvis Limited. Because Mr. Purvis had an import agency here, which subsequently developed into the largest um, type of its business in Bermuda. And my father was a buyer at Belmont Hotel. And one day, Mr. Purvis was calling on him. My father had just recently received a letter from me from school and said, oh, got a letter from my son, Mr. Purvis. Would you like to read it? Passed it to Mr. Purvis, and Mr. Purvis read it and said, Mr. Sharp, that's a very good letter. Communications are very important in my business or the ability to communicate. I wonder if your son would like to come back and work with me. So I did, and I stayed there, and I'm still there as chairman of the company now. Yes, when I started with Purvis Limited, I expect in 1938, it was a relatively small firm of importers, perhaps with about 20 people at most, operating out of a small two-story building on Burnaby Street. And um, I was jack of all trades. Most of us were jack of all trades then. I did some typing. I did a bit of bookkeeping, dock clearance, dock deliveries, before I finally got on the road as a salesman. And in those days, you started sort of at the West End. You'd either take the boat up to dockyard, make your calls on all the way back to Hamilton using your bike, or you'd ride your bike slowly to dockyard, stopping and making calls on the way, and put your bike on the ferry and come back to Hamilton. Well, it wasn't too long following the outbreak of war that Bermuda mobilized, and uh, most people over the age of 18 were called up. Um, whites went into the Bermuda Rifles, all the engineers. Blacks joined the Bermuda militia or artillery. And it wasn't until um, long after the war that those units were amalgamated to these. I liked the army very much. I loved the route marches, the drills, the physical exercise, and all of those aspects of it. But finally, I got a bit bored with it, I suppose, and I 
like to think it was the call of duty that uh, inclined me to go overseas, but I think it was more a sense of adventure. So we had to take some tests here to ascertain that if we, when we got to Canada, we would it be accepted into the Air Force. So I successfully navigated that hurdle. Went to Canada. In those days, we took off in one of the Cavaliers, just from right outside my house here, Darrell's Island, for the seven-hour flight, I think it was, to Baltimore, from whence we went to Montreal for some initial training, and finally to Malton, near Toronto, for uh, navigational training. And from then we went to, um, from there we went to England. I remember the ship was was called the Andes, that we went from Halifax to Liverpool, I think it was. It was built for navigation in the uh, in South America in the rivers, and here we were crossing the Atlantic on it. So there again, it was a pretty stormy trip, as I remember. Two meals a day. We lined up with your mess tin, got your stew or whatever else was going. And we slept in sort of three tiers, one tier under the table, one tier on a table, and one tier on a hammock over the table. But it didn't seem particularly uncomfortable at the time. Would be now, <laughs> once you become accustomed to all the comforts of life, but then it, it seemed to be normal. And at, once we got to England, there was still a lot of training to do. We went First we went to Bournemouth, and um, that was just a holding station there before we were sent to proper training. There was, uh, Bournemouth was virtually in sight of France. And uh, sometimes we used to listen to Lord Haw Haw, I remember, who was a traitor that defected to Germans. And he once said, we've been asked the question as to why we don't bomb the Canadians in Bournemouth. The reason we're not proposing to do that is that... Um, those that don't drink themselves to death will probably kill themselves in operational training. So, <laughs> but uh, we didn't take him very seriously, of course. And um, we moved around from there. Some of us went, I went out to Wales, to um, the Isle of Anglesey, where the major problem was avoiding Mount Snowdon. And then up to Lassie Mouse, where we got on to heavier aircraft still, and it was in Lassie Mouse that we found our crews. We just paired up voluntarily with people, and I had a Canadian pilot. I was a navigator. And Canadian bomber, a Canadian gunner, an Australian gunner, and a Newfoundland... Uh, yeah, Newfoundland gunner. And... Um, a Newcastle engineer. So we came down from there to home on Spalding Moor, no, to Rickall, it was in Yorkshire. And that, that's when we um, did training on to prepare for the Halifaxes we were going to fly during operations and subsequently changed to home on Spalding Moor and flew Halifaxes from there day and night operations, but the war was well on its way then, and I got in 15 operations before it was over. In 1948, following his return to Bermuda, Sir John met and married his wife, Eileen. Uh, whenever over the years I've spoken to any Canadian groups, I've always told them that I had a very close association with Canada. I went to school there, and I served in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and I married a Canadian, but I always 
add, not in order of their importance. My uh, wife proved to be a marvelous homemaker, which makes it easier for any man to do his job. And she was very good at keeping politics in a sensible perspective. Sometimes returning home at night a bit dispirited about something and complaining, she would interrupt and say, how are the children? I would respond, the children are fine, but what does that have to do with this? Things came back into perspective with her reply, what's more important than the children? Sir John went on to discuss his political career. Well, I'd wanted to stand for Parliament in 1958 because I'd been very much involved in the parish through the church and the parish vestry and any other organization that was in Warwick, I was in it. But in 1958, Purvis Limited said um, I was needed there, at least for the next five years, but I did extract a promise from them that I could stand in 1963. Um, so I did. And that was at the time when you could develop your own political platform, which I did on various things, education, roads, and in fact on politics themselves by standing as an independent and um, advancing arguments indeed as to why Bermuda was best served with independent members of parliament. I stood in Warwick West, there were four of us stood, no other, nobody standing as party members. And um, at that time, I suppose being a relatively new face to the political scene, it was appreciated and I topped the poll. In fact, I got almost as many votes as everybody else there put together. Um, got into parliament did some, I hope, useful things as an independent. In fact, it was great fun being an independent because you just stood up and spoke your own views uh, and with a great deal of conviction. One of the first things I did as an independent member of Parliament in my early years was having observed the difficulty children were having getting to the waterfront here on Hamilton Harbour in Warwick that I petitioned Parliament to buy some waterfront and create a swimming dock which is there to this day greatly used more particularly by people from uh, Warwick Park and Hillview and Cedar Hill but as I say those I guess I succumbed to party politics within about a year and a half of having been in Parliament because six members from the Progressive Labour Party had been elected. And while they had very severe ups and downs themselves in those early years, they tended to vote as a block. And the rest of the Parliament being fairly evenly split, or if they were, or when they were fairly evenly split, it was then obvious that things always went the way of the Progressive Labour Party. And um, Sir Henry Tucker then formed up the United Bermuda Party, to which most, not all, but most of the members of a sort of different political philosophy from the Progressive Labour Party joined. I had my reservations. I was the last signatory to the party, as a matter of fact, because I thought, that theoretically at least, it was wrong that although the United Bermuda Party might, might uh, outside of the House, support a measure by a majority, uh, when it got to the House, that didn't necessarily reflect a majority of support from members of Parliament when you consider the opposition as well. But then you come to terms with the fact that uh, if you join a political philosophy, as it were, you have to subscribe to what a majority of those feel. That's the whole cornerstone of party politics. 
So those were very heady, exciting days with responsible government, the first old Bermudian government. And um, being Minister of Finance, we had to start very quickly raising funds to do things that the more laissez-faire type of government before had left undone. And to do that, we had to raise taxes. In fact, I remember in those days, the <clears throat> business of government was so, to some extent conducted from Sir Henry's office at the Bank of Bermuda, where he was the chief general manager. And I remember one day he called me up and said, Jack, I've got the Chamber of Commerce, the Hotel Employers of Bermuda, the Employers Council, and some other employer organizations down here complaining like the devil about you. Do you want to come down and talk with them? So I scurried down to the Bank of Bermuda. I think they were all sitting around the Bank of Bermuda boardroom table all of the employer organizations, and I sat down almost breathless from having rushed so fast and gasped out, what's the problem? And they said, well, the problem is you're taxing us, your supporters, to do things for people who under no circumstances are ever going to support the party. Can you deny that? I said, no, you're absolutely right. I said, taxing you because you're the ones that got the money, doing it for them because they're the ones that have the need. And uh, I said, you're right, they're probably never going to support us at the polls, but they're going to make their contribution to Bermuda in its stability if they're satisfied they're being fairly treated. And one of them said, gee, never looked at it that way before. You're probably right. End of interview. I was fairly experienced by then, having been in Parliament for about 12 years and having been Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier as well. And it was an exhilarating experience to be leader of your country. In my two years, uh, we as a government did some good work not least being the preparation of the Green Paper on Independence, which I presented to Parliament in 1976. And now, almost 20 years later, I'm again involved in that particular subject. But at the election following me becoming Premier, we lost four seats and then another one at a by-election. And although we still had a majority of 25 to 15, which would be pretty good if it were today, some of my colleagues began to get rather nervous and pressed me, pressed for a change of leadership. So finally I resigned to give somebody else a chance to pull the party together and hold the country together. But I always considered myself lucky to have had two years as Premier of Bermuda, and even more lucky perhaps to have been able to go on to do some useful work over the next 15 years or so. In fact, I have a recollection of, uh, of uh, John Swan being elected Premier. And I was, I suppose, a bit of a mentor of John's. So immediately following his successful election by the parliamentary group, he asked me, go to lunch with him. So he sat down and he said, Jack, I want you to do something for me. I said, no, John, I don't want to do that. He said, I haven't even asked you yet. I said, I know what you're going to ask me. You're going to be asking me for Minister of Labor and Immigration, it was called then, subsequently changed to Labor and Home Affairs. And I said, you know, I've been busy enough. I'd like something a little less demanding now. And he said, 
Jack, you helped me this far. I want you to go this last mile with me, just for a few years. So eight years later, I reminded him of that conversation and said, it's time for a change. And that was when Mr. Pierman took over. And then because he had some personal problems that he had to attend to, I moved back to Labor and Home Affairs. So I suppose I was in that portfolio for almost 10 years in total. And um, very demanding years. And uh, challenging years. But I think during that long period of time, I don't believe we had one really protracted strike. We had a lot of disputes, but we managed to get them solved short of a strike. But they were in home affairs is a very demanding portfolio because you either uh, issuing permits which people think you should, or you're not issuing permits which people th think you should. Or you're putting controversial people on the stop list, which others think shouldn't be on it. So uh, it's a, it is very challenging, but it makes a substantial contribution to stability of Bermuda, too. From his start as a young officer in the Canadian Air Force to his rise to Premier, Sir John's career has encompassed many changes. Nowadays, he takes his time to well, reflect. I've, I've been, I think, uniquely uh, fortunate in both. I started uh, with Purvis Limited. I worked my way through their system and to the top, uh, where I'm still sitting, as a matter of fact. I'm somewhat involved with the uh, Drug Council Partners. I'm uh, quite involved with Warwick Academy and their efforts to raise funds as they go private so that children with ability can still get into Warwick Academy, but including those who may not have the ability to pay. Now, I've always enjoyed gardening, even when I didn't have much leisure time because it's very good exercise. It takes your mind off other things. I've always enjoyed reading. I think my political reading started with um, Franklin Roosevelt and the politics of the New Deal, I think it was called then. In retrospect, I don't think there's anything much I would have done very differently insofar as advice to anybody getting into politics these days. It's quite different from when I first got in because when I first got in, I served in and for all the Warwick organizations. There's no substitute for honesty, integrity, and industry in whatever you do, and certainly Parliament's no exception. Thank you.